We've come a long way. The internet, smartphones, self-driving cars, drones, social networks. We have better medical knowledge than ever before, more access to information than any other time in history. We can fly to the other side of the world in a matter of hours. We progress and evolve and create new technological wonders. But not everything new is progress. Not everything forgotten irrelevant. There are some things worth remembering. I like it too. We're starting a brand new series today, The Forgotten Art Of, then reclaiming God's good gifts. And we're going to list certain things over the weeks ahead, starting with today, that we believe have been forgotten, that are lost, and we need to bring them back into our lives because of the power they have in relationships. And so we know that certain things change over time. You know, they do. Certain things change over time. And, and we know that some things change with time, and that's okay. It's okay if they change over time. Now, I apologize. I thought about it this morning. If this is your wedding photo, I'm sorry. It was picked at random. Those are styles that maybe we're glad they change over time. And then there's some styles we don't want to change, and we know that because we've kept them, especially during car week, and when they change, it's sad. For example, look at this beautiful work of art. It's a Dodge Charger. We don't want to lose the sense of artistic styling and all that that goes with this car, because look what can happen next. That's a Dodge Charger also. How about we forget about that Dodge Charger? Here's another example. Is that not sweet? You know, you get more oohs and ahs with Mustangs than you do with Chargers. And so they had a hit with Mustangs, but then look what they did next. That's a Mustang with four barking cylinders in it, nearly making it move. Tell you what, some things ought to be forgotten over time, and some things should be recaptured, shouldn't they be? So in the weeks ahead, starting with today, there are things that change with time, and, and God wants his people to reclaim them. So I'm going to go down a list of these for you today, because we'll start, and then you'll see in the weeks ahead. We're going to start today with the forgotten art of listening. Then we're going to move to the forgotten art of forgiveness, the forgotten art of acceptance, the art of contentment, the art of hard work, the art of fellowship, and the art for heart for the lost. I want to demonstrate to you a technique that I use with staff that really works. I'll be surprised. We'll see if it works in here. Ready? Shh. It's about, <laughs> it's about listening. Those are all about listening. And Cole said earlier this morning, he goes, yeah, you got to do your Dennis Shush thing that you do. Because it really works in a meeting. For years I've been doing this. If it's not quite quiet enough and people are still talking, somebody will say, Dennis, do the thing. And I go, shh, and it works. It's about listening. It's about listening. So we're going to start with the most important art of all, and I really believe it is. If we just make good progress with this art, this forgotten art, we reclaim it. We bring it into our lives and our hearts, and we make it active and, and useful in our lives. Guess what? The weeks ahead will be so much better positioned to take in those forgotten arts if we've reclaimed and recaptured the ability to listen well. And each week, we're going to have a rhythm of how we do these messages. There's going to be five movements in each message. And it's going to be movement one is really the master artist's plan. Like, what was God's original design for this particular art? Movement two will be the forgotten art. There was a day 
when it seemed to work, but somehow the day got lost, and that ended up with movement three. The picture got marred. It got distorted. It got changed and changed into something else that wasn't the original plan. And movement four is revival, renewal, and renovation. How we reclaim this art and build it back into our lives. And that allows us to move to movement five. We become an artist again in these areas. So you might think, well, is it really an art? We think it is. Listening and all the others, because what they do is if you do them well, they create something beautiful, don't they? Just like a painting. They create a, a different kind of relationship where there's more joy and love and, and, and walking together shared. And there's more connection to our Father in heaven. And I'll tell you in a little while how those two are linked together. Listening to each other is linked with listening to God. So before we dig into listening this morning, would you just join with me and let's pray for a moment here. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to take in what you have to say to us today in reclaiming the lost art, the forgotten art of listening. Be with us, Father. Speak to each one of us one by one because we're all different. We're all somewhere in this. Help us take it in as you intend it. And we pray this and look forward to it in the name of of Jesus. An old Jewish proverb says, no one is as deaf as the man who will not listen. And then there's a statement by a man named Ed Brodow, and he is one of the top coaches of negotiating in this country, negotiating deals and business and anything that's kind of amiss and needs negotiation. He made this statement. He said, the catch in this is that listening is the forgotten art. We are so busy making sure that people hear what we have to say that we forget to listen. So let's look at movement one, the artist's plan. The Lord is the art, the creator of all things, the artist, the master artist. He's the creator of all things. So in the Garden of Eden in chapter two, He's presenting to Adam and Eve, really, you know, I've made all this for you, and I just want you to take care of it, and it's all yours, and please enjoy. Just enjoy it. There's just one little thing. Do not eat from the tree of good and evil. Just, just don't. See, now here's the dilemma, because humans have free choice. Love doesn't work without free choice. So the Lord gives us free choice. And in Genesis 2, he was told, they were told, just don't eat from this tree of good and evil, because when you eat of it, you will surely die. And we know what happened next. We'll get to that in a little while. So in movement number two, we can look at really the forgotten art. There was a time, there was something you listened to, something you took in that just brings sweet memories and recollections. And it's an example of how listening works for us. And I made a list of some of mine. These aren't all of mine. There's probably thousands, but here's some. I want to share them with you. Here's something I listened to, and I'm so glad I did. The doctor's instructions in Flagstaff Community Hospital OB ward, when I was coaching my wife in delivery, or delivery of our first child, and he says, hey, you want, it? you want to deliver the baby? I said, what? He says, yeah, you come in, stand here, and listen to me. I'm so glad I listened to him because I didn't drop her. I didn't screw it up. And two and a half years later, I'd gone away, come back, was working for the university. Yet another child about to be born, same hospital, same nurse, same doctor. And he goes, hey, you want to do this one? I said, do I? And my kids are really glad I listened to him also. <laughs> Something else I remember I'll never forget. It just made an impact on me. I listened I understood what it meant, and I took it in. It's the first day that my wife, Heather, said, I love you. Oh, my gosh. Took it in. I listened. I understood. Something else I've listened to many, many times, and it just gets me every time. It's the Beach Boys singing, God Only Knows. I love the harmonies. It takes me back to Huntington Beach. It does all kinds of great things. And then starting up in the 60s, my Oldsmobile 442 with Jardine headers. It's like... <gasps> rumble, rumble, rumble. It does something. I'll never forget. 
And I remember listening to the radio broadcast of C.S. Lewis, captured forever, him giving these Sunday messages in the 40s, and the scratchy radio broadcast, and all those messages were assembled together to make the book Mere Christianity. I'll never forget the sound of his voice, the tone and the power of what he said. I'll never forget being at Maccabee Beach, having my dive instructor, 1993, tell me just how to go about getting my gear together, double-checking, triple-checking, because I was going in to get certified on the final weekend. Every word he said was etched in my brain. I listened well. I'll never forget what I heard when I listened to Lonnie Frisbee in 1970 on stage at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, the original Calvary Chapel. And he had robes, tie-dyed robes to the ground and a beard to here and hair like this. And at the end, I didn't know anything about Christianity, nothing. Friends got me to go there. And he gave an altar call and I went forward and accepted Christ. I'll never forget listening to that message. You know what else I'll never forget? And I could listen to over and over again Waves breaking on the shore. Never forget. It's powerful. I have a million more memories, and you have yours too, and you, you've thought of a few right now as I'm going through my list. Think of them. Reflect on them. Embrace them. Relish them through listening. So we know that in movement three, the picture was marred. The picture got messed up, again, because of free choice. So in Genesis 3... After God has said, it's all yours, it's all for you, just don't eat of the tree of good and evil. And they listen, but kind of didn't take it in because along comes the serpent. He gives them a different message. Oh, surely you're not going to die. No, you're, you're good. Go ahead. That one they took in and they put it into action and sin entered the world. And to this day, we know the world is a broken world and we're broken people doing our best in this broken world. What was God's perfect plan? To listen to him, take it into account, make it part of us and do what he's called us to do. And we struggle with it to this day. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. I struggle with it at times to this day. So let's look at what God's word has to say about this. It has plenty to say. What about this biblical picture of a bad listener? Proverbs kind of refers to it as the proverbial fool. But let's hear what the Bible has to say. Proverbs 18.2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, blessed rather, meaning blessed instead of, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God, and obey it. Hearing means nothing if you do nothing with what you've heard when you're hearing from the Lord. Next, Proverbs 18, 13. This is convicting to me. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. You didn't hear it really, you didn't take it in. As soon as there was a microsecond of a pause, you jumped in. You missed a chunk of the message, and there we are. Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? Well, there's more hope for a fool than for him. Not much listening going on, just hasty words, hasty expressions. So I'm going to go down the road a little further on poor listening. I found this list edited a bit from... Crew, which is the modern name for what was formerly called Campus Crusade for Christ. And here's poor listeners in general. See if you find yourself in here. You better find yourself in here. I want you to be convicted because it convicted me to write this. And we're the same, aren't we? Nobody's mastered this, but we want to continue to reclaim it. So we have to know what it is, right? So let me go through some of these habits of poor listening. Change the subject away from whatever the other person is talking about. So maybe I'm talking about my boat. I love my boat in the way that, you know, you love a boat. Not as much as I love my wife and my family and you. But just below that, I love my boat. 
So say I'm talking to someone about my boat, and they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I finish, and they go, I bought an airplane. <laughs> what does that have to do with a Were you even listening? Or bring the conversation back to themselves. You're sharing something like, boy, I had a hard time when I visited my family. Oh, oh, my family. Let me tell you about my family. It's almost like, why did I even bother? Or you don't ask follow-up questions. Maybe the whole time you're listening, you're quiet, and that's respectful and good, but at the end, they're waiting, and you're just... When we ask follow-up questions, we're saying, okay, I heard this. Can I ask you something about that? Tell me a little more about it. Can you give me more about this? Or, again, begin to talk about similar events in their past. It's one of the things I do in grief counseling. People grieving will tell me, you know, I try to share when people say, how are you doing with your loss? And when I start to say, they say, you know what happens right away? They talk about their loss. I, I, I wanted, I thought we were talking about mine. Oh, oh, you got a loss? Let me tell you about my loss. That's a little bit like bringing the conversation back to yourselves. Or maybe they interrogate the people they talk to. So, Zach, why'd you do that? Why'd you say that? What's that about? What's going on? What are you thinking? What's the point of all that? What, what is this? You're like, oh, back away, Sherlock. <laughs> hey, I thought we were having a conversation. Sometimes it's an interrogation. Poor listeners have a habit of starting to think about how they respond before the others are even finished. And you know what? I can see it in people. I can see you. And sometimes I do it. You're talking and they're, they were listening and then they're going, okay, yeah. And you realize, oh my gosh, they're building something, getting ready to launch at the moment I give them a brief window. And guess what? You can't do that and listen to. You can't. Or they don't even show interest in the conversation of the person they're listening to. I had it happen just a while ago. Someone said, hey, how's it? Oh, I asked them, I said, hey, how you doing with moving here? And how's the move gone and everything? They told me and they were sharing and all that. And they said, how about you? I said, you know, I've lived here a long time. And as I was talking, they just went. <laughs> and it was so bizarre. I thought, what, what, this, did I do, what? What happened? They just weren't interested anymore. <laughs> I'm not interested in what you're saying. I'll see you later. <laughs> Poor listeners in general, here it is, get distracted by their phone or some other screen. If you're talking to me, please don't check your phone and tell me you can hear me too. Don't even do it because I know it isn't true. Poor listeners, don't make appropriate eye contact. And often they share unsolicited advice or opinions. Here's a rule in therapy. Counseling, marriage counseling, any kind of counseling, in communication. I've said it, I don't know how many times from this stage, I'm happy to say it again. Refrain from offering unsolicited advice, criticism, and commentary unless the person has just burst into flames. <laughs> just don't do it. They're grown-ups. If they want it, they'll ask. Poor listeners make distracting listening sounds. When I first opened my practice in Pleasanton, a local psychologist wanted to come over and see what we were all doing. And there was three guys. I was the fourth. We ended up with 13. But they wanted to meet and talk. And so I said, all right, well, let's talk. And they wanted to ask about how things were going. And so, that, like, you're the guy right there. And I'm saying, well, here's the kind of work I do. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh-huh, uh-huh. I was like, well, what's happening here? I thought, I'm just going to go out of the room while you're making those noises, and I'll come back in when I can tell they've stopped. That's poor listening. And how about talking over? Poor listeners start talking before others have finished what they were saying. I was working with a couple recently, brand new. I get all the information from them, and I say, so tell me what made you want to call and come in. Well, I just feel like this is what's going on. Well, that's not what's going on. It's going on, but it is going on. And it's, so I just let them run. Just run. Go, go, go. 10, 11, 12 minutes. They finally got tired, I guess. And it kind of ebbed a little bit. And they finally realized I was just sitting over there all by myself. And they said, so what do you think? I said, can I ask you something? Sure. Is this what happens at home? 
Is this how it is for you? Yeah, I think we're going to need to make some adjustments. How can you ever hear if you're just talking over each other? And lastly, poor listeners have negative non-verbals. Arms crossed, head down, frowning, and here's the number one. You're talking to me and I go, I didn't say a word. What did I do wrong? That's poor listening. So let's look at movement four, reclaiming God's good gift. The Bible offers wonderful guidance in this area as well. Let's walk through some of the scripture. This one is just so beautiful. If you don't know this one, write it down. Psalm 4610. If you know it, shout it out. You're just quiet and reserved. I get that. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Shut the noise down. Stop the distractions. Get quiet, he says. And know. Not just read my word or throw up a prayer, but know. Take it in. Understand that I am God. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, we, we read more. It says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It means instead of what came before, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's a blessing to take in the word of God and seek to see what it means. Find out so that you can understand and move forward with what he's saying in his scripture. In Romans 10, verse 17, Apostle Paul says this. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You see, twice he says it's about hearing. It's about taking it in. It's about finding the meaning and understanding it and having it make a difference inside of you. In Ecclesiastes, it said this, and I want to unpack it a bit because it really, we can see how it applies to us today. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, guard your steps. When you go to the house of God, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. So where's the house of God today? Jesus says, I am in you, you are in me. This is a dwelling place of the Lord now in our hearts. So now when we read this, it says, guard our steps when we go into the Lord's presence and that's within. When they get quiet, invite him in. And just say, speak to me. And I want to listen rather than just throw my stuff out. I just want to take it in, Lord, and listen. There's a quote in the Life Application Study Bible Commentary that I really enjoy. When we enter God's presence, we should have the attitude of being open and ready to listen to God. Not to dictate to him what he ought to do. And lastly... I want to refer to a verse in the book of James that we refer to often because it works in so many consequences. But before I do, let's set the stage a little bit. James is the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. And as the leader of the first church, he's got to set the ground rules. He, got to, he has to establish a foundation. Here's the things we do. Here's the things we don't do. We got a marching orders. We got a way to do stuff. This is revolutionary. And he says this, my dear brothers and sisters, he loved him. That's his family. Take note of this. He's saying, stop for a minute. Consider this. Write it down if you have to. This is so important. Take note. He says, be quick to listen. Slow to speak and even slower to become angry. Listen is number one because why? Without listening, nothing else works as it should. It cannot work as it should. And I hope you agree with me. That's been my life. My troubles often come from not listening and listening well. And the blessings come from doing a better job at that. I want to read some things that were written a long, long time ago to you in a moment, written by this remarkable man who died in his late 30s. And he's studied by probably every seminary student on the planet. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And his most famous book, probably most well-known, is called The Cost of Discipleship. I have a copy 
in our living room on the bookshelf. He was an incredible theologian, a brilliant mind, and a teacher, and a preacher. And the authorities in wartime, World War II Germany, were doing everything they could to shut him down. And he would not be silenced. He knew the truth. He knew the gospel. Such that they finally executed him just before World War II ended. He never got to see the freedom. But the Lord used him in a mighty way. And he wrote this in his book, Life Together. He said, here's something to avoid. Here's something to avoid. He's teaching this to students. Avoid this kind of listening with half an ear that presumes already to know what the other person has to say. This, he says, is an impatient, inattentive listening that is only waiting for a chance to speak. And he also writes this. Just as love to God, in other words, in God's view, as love to God, begins with listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brethren, us, is learning to listen to them. He goes on to say, you know, often a person can be helped merely by having someone who will listen to him seriously at times, what our neighbor needs most is for someone else to know. So I've been a professional marriage family therapist for a long, long time. We had a couple in first service. I see some here that I know and have great respect for. One of the first things we learn in school to learn how to become a counselor is how to offer unconditional positive regard. And we do it through what? Through listening. Through listening. Number one, is that fair, Larry, to say? Number one is through listening. And so he also warns, though, that there's a risk that comes with tuning others out. And Bonhoeffer connects our ability to listen to one another directly to our ability to listen to the Father. He says they're not two different things. They're intertwined. They fuse. They work together. And so he says this. He who can no longer listen to his brother will soon no longer be listening to God either. He will be doing nothing but prattle in the presence of God too. I like the word prattle. Pastor Roy and I are talking about bringing it back into common usage. And if you hear it somewhere else, you'll know that it started here. If anybody makes money off of it, we want to cut. Prattle. That's just going on and on about nothing. He said, this is the beginning of the death of the spiritual life. Anyone who thinks that his time is too valuable to spend keeping quiet will eventually have no time for God or his brother, but only for himself and for his own follies. So evangelism, which is sharing the good news of the gospel, is about relationships, isn't it? I mean, we can all hear someone preach that we don't know and be moved and drawn to it. True. But day in and day out, it's more about relationships than anything else. Absolutely. And God himself demonstrates this to us. And how does he do that? Do you know the word tells us he's constantly after you. He's constantly seeking you. He constantly wants intimacy with you. Jesus says, I call you my friends. He wants fellowship with us. That's who our God is. And so we are a Mago Dei, created in his image, meaning what? That's how we're wired for relationships. That's where all the very best things happen. The apostles learned all about relationship, traveling with Jesus. At the Last Supper, they were all gathered together, and he gave them the, the most fantastic teaching to prepare them for what was to come. But guess what? They're gone. They're in heaven now. We're the disciples now. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. It's us. Now it's about our relationships, the way we fellowship, the way we engage with others. Because the experience of being listened to and understood opens people's hearts to the possibility of God. 
Now let's go down a list of what good listeners do. We need things to aspire to. And I aspire to these things. I'm not there. I'm not. I was convicted in the first list, and I aspire to strive from this list. Good listeners are present. They're here now. They pay attention in obvious ways with eye contact and body language. They put the distractions away. They offer empathy. Empathy is one of the most powerful dynamics in a human relationship. What does empathy say in a relationship? It says, I don't know exactly how you're feeling, but I'm doing everything I can to get a taste of it, to kind of understand it so that I can walk with you and be with you. I can mourn with you and rejoice with you because I have a sense of what it must be like for you. Good listening has empathy built in. Good listeners ask timely questions to clarify or to seek more information on the topic. I do it all the time, and I'll say this. I'll say, can I ask you some questions? I don't just ask them. I say, Is yeah, I missed one thing, and I wonder if there's more about the other thing. You know when you do that, it's absolutely confirmed that you're listening. You wouldn't even know what to ask if you weren't listening. Those things send a signal to the other person. Good listeners... Listen for meaning. You know, be thinking two levels. I got the words, but what's under it? I, I want to know what's in there. What's the thing that needs to be conveyed? And good listeners periodically summarize. I do it all the time. I'll say, okay, I heard all this. Can I, can I give you a little feedback? I want to know if this, these things you were saying right here, do I have it right? Is it, do I got it? Yeah, I got it. Summarize. Good listening. Good listeners avoid judgments. It's so important when I'm giving someone a good listening to that I don't get distracted by thinking, oh, I'd never do that. I'd never say what they said. I'd never think that. Now you're doing judgments. It's going to come out of your, in your affect towards them and listening. We just put that aside. Good listeners pay attention to body language. And good listeners can hear mild criticism and stay focused. Good listeners can disagree. Has there ever been a time when it's more important to improve our listening than now? Stop shouting and start listening. Stop deflecting and start listening. Now be a great time. Good listeners seek time and space and silence to hear from God in prayer. And the Bible's God's word, by the way. You can read it and you know you're hearing from God. The Bible actually is him speaking. If we can stretch the term, we should. Him speaking. It's not just written stuff. It's our Heavenly Father the Trinity, three in one, speaking to us. I came across, across this uh, quote from Faith Ward. It says, when you're unsure what to say to someone, listening to what they have to say is often a great place to start. And sharing the gospel is no exception. Movement five, this is it. We're artists. We can do this. We can be creative and we can be supportive and we can build beautiful things by recapturing, reclaiming these arts. In listening to God, we receive from the artist slash creator of all things and we learn to share the beauty of what he shares with us. I want to share a prayer with you. If you feel like reading along with me, go ahead. I found this prayer. It was written by the pastor of... Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and listen for the end, the way he ends it. Lord Jesus, I want to help the people in my life come to know you. I recognize that I can only help others come to know you through my own relationship with you. Jesus, I invite you anew. Come into my life. Grant me the grace of friendship and intimacy with you. Give me courage to surrender myself to you, especially those parts of my heart that don't yet belong to you. Show me, Jesus, the people in my life that you want me to befriend and build relationship with. And here it is. Teach me, Jesus, how to be good at relationship, how to love how to listen, and how to humbly share my faith. I found this prayer to be profoundly beautiful and wise. That last line, 
how to love, how to listen, how to humbly share my faith. You see, we use listening to each other to help us discover how our relationship can create a picture of the love of Jesus, what we were created to do. So I, I've got an acronym for you, and it's appropriate. It's Car Week. It's from the old Chevy Love Truck, L-U-V, which is really good that it went away. <laughs> little tiny truck that was gutless and useless, but they had light utility vehicle. I have co-opted that. Effective listening is the foundation to good communication. Good communication is the foundation to a loving and healthy relationship. And being open to, to share and be heard is the foundation to the success of a resilient relationship. One of the greatest gifts we can give each other is a gift of our undivided attention, being present in the moment and treat them as though they're the only person on earth. So here comes L-U-V. Listening well leads to L, being understood which leads to feeling valued, which tells you you are able to be loved. Listening, understanding, value creates love. You might have been wondering why this basket is up here. In the early 70s, I was a student at Northern Arizona University. And as my social work methods class assignment asked us to be to do an internship at some community health service in the town of Flagstaff, Arizona. I picked a place called the Lark Center, L-A-R-C, Local Alcoholism Reception Center, because at that time, in Arizona, being drunk in public was not illegal. But they thought, we can't just leave people laying around who have passed out, so they would bring them to this center. It was the worst of the worst of the worst. I loved it. I learned something about myself. But what we would do is they'd come in either by walking, even, the, even in the winter and in the snow, ambulance, police cars, friends, that's how they came to us. And we'd escort, it was a two-story converted motel. We'd escort them to one of the rooms down the hall to sleep off, men to the right, women to the left. Upstairs was residences for people who were in long-term recovery and doing well. I was in Spanish language immersion eight hours a day. I would leave and then do a four to midnight shift there or a midnight to 8 a.m. shift three days a week, because you're young and strong, you can do anything, right? The thought of it now makes me tired. <laughs> but after a few nights, I'm a kid from L.A., right? I've never been to this part of the world. And, and this gentleman who lived upstairs, who was doing really well, would come down and talk to me. And after a week or two, he came down one night. It's 2 to 3 a.m. His name was Doc, and he had this gorgeous cowboy hat and this beautiful necklace that he had made. He was a Navajo silversmith and he had this Naji it's called. It's a, a kind of a necklace with turquoise and silver, beautifully tooled, immaculately dressed and we would chit chat. And one night I said to him, I said, Doc, I, I don't get it. I, I'm trying to understand all the cultural mix here and flag stuff. I don't even know how to connect with people. It's nothing I do is working. And there's all the, there's Native American tribes here. There's all these different cultures. I don't know what to do. And do you know what's going on? And he paused. He looked at me and he, he looked away and he says, it's about listening. I said, what do you mean? I'm listening. He goes, no. It's about listening the way my people listen. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's like my people have a basket. And say I'm holding my basket, my uncle comes to me and he says, Doc, I have something I have to say to you. I have to talk with you. And Doc says, okay, uncle. So Doc looks in his basket and this is what he says to me. Now in the basket I have my ideas, my thinking, my opinions, my experience, my beliefs. I got all my stuff in here. This is my basket. But my uncle has come to me and he wants to talk to me. I have to empty my basket out. My biases, my judgments, my opinions, my reactions, all of it. And I say, okay, uncle, go ahead. And he talks to me. And it all goes in the basket. And when he's done, I say, are you done, uncle? Is that it? Yeah. Let me look through these things and consider them. 
Even if it's about Doc, he's going to consider him. And he'll take the things that really make sense that he understands or maybe ask more questions. My challenge to you today is to consider having your own basket. You see, that day was in 1972, and I'm old, and I got to tell you, I knew that day I would never forget it. I was exhausted. I was always exhausted as a college student there. And I thought, I'm never going to forget this, and I never have. I can tell you the colors of the clothes he was wearing. I can tell you about the tie I had on my long hair and ponytail. I can tell you all of that. Will you consider today having your basket? Reclaiming the forgotten art of listening and thinking of art as when I listen better, it's going to create something beautiful. It's going to be more of, it's going to be better than, it's going to be a, a, a beautiful work in this relationship. The way God designed it to be all the way back in the beginning. Would you consider that today? That when you leave here, you'll always remember the basket. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I am so grateful you put Doc in my life for those few months. I'll never forget. And now, Lord, to learn that you're Holy Word links our listening to each other with listening to you as Bonhoeffer taught us. Lord, that's an amazing thing. Thank you for that. Now I pray for each person here. Each one is created in your image with a plan and a purpose. And we're your disciples. Help us grow in this area as we need to grow and remind us as we need to be reminded so that we can go out of here and in all of our relationships grow in listening and caring, and spreading your love, Jesus, of us to others who need you, and the love to those close to us and beyond. Be open, poured into our hearts and our minds, and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, and all the people together said, amen. Well, I'm so glad you were here today. It's good to have you, but I got some stuff I got to share with you before you go. First of all, if you want prayer, we're going to have people here and maybe somebody here, but certainly over here. And we love to pray with people. We just love it. That's why we do it. So please don't hesitate. If there's something on your heart you want to pray with someone about. After this service at 1230, we have the volunteer barbecue. And everyone who's volunteered here has been invited. We are so glad you're going to come and enjoy that. Uh, people have volunteered in ministries all across the spectrum. And now we want to honor you and all that you bring to Shoreline by being part of this community and helping do what we do as a church. If you're new today, you can text WELCOME. If you're online, certainly text WELCOME, 221-0290 for our digital connection card. And if you're physically here and you're new, go out to the Connection Center when you're done. Ask any question you want. Tell us you're new. We got a bag, a gift for you. Answer questions. We have instructions if you want them. We'll just tell you what we're all about. We love that. And I think that's what we have for our final announcement. So now, would you please stand and join me as I give you a blessing to leave. May you leave here committed to the forgotten art of listening and committed to the weeks that follow to use the listening here that we've shared in the weeks that come so that you can invest in these relationships in a way that God's designed you to do and share the love of Jesus. I pray that you walk out of here. May you walk out of here with your own basket and keep it with you at all times. God bless. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon.